Hello, welcome to Big Picture Monday. My name is Callie Black here with all the context you need to totally wrap this week's Come Follow Me readings. This week we dive into the book of Jacob with Jacob chapters one through four. I hope you had a fantastic Easter week last week celebrating our Savior's life, his death, his resurrection, the miracle, and everything that that represents. So I hope you had a great week diving into that. And then we've got another great weekend coming up here with General Conference. And then at the same time, we're now diving into a whole new book of scripture, um, which is just going to open the doors to, it's like this whole separate section of the Book of Mormon, that first quarter, all Nephi. Now we're going to go into tons more stories and tons more stuff. In fact, today is the day that my second quarter study guide starts. Big picture, little picture study guide. If you haven't grabbed yours yet, go ahead and grab it right now. You've got time. You can get a physical book like this or you can get a digital download on my website. I give you everything that I talk about here in Big Picture Monday videos written down so you can reference it easier. Plus tons of more details, lists of people that you need to know, places. We've got an amazing map from Sarah at All of That Designs, seven spiritual guiding questions, more detailed chapter summary, all sorts of good stuff. So grab it, open it up, make sure you're ready to go. Um, and then... Yeah, I can't wait. Especially Sunday school will be in a couple weeks. So make sure you grab it now <laughs> so that you're ready. Um, but for those of you who teach Sunday school, I know you're out there. But uh, let's start. Let's start talking about Jacob. We get a new narrator for the first time. Um, to be fair, Nephi did quote Jacob a little bit in uh, Second Nephi there. But we are now going fully to Jacob. As a quick reminder of who Jacob is, he is Nephi's younger brother. You'll remember that he was born in the wilderness to Lehi and Sariah after they had left Jerusalem. They hadn't come to the promised land yet. They, uh, Jacob and his younger brother Joseph, were born in the wilderness, so likely much younger than Nephi. Um, they're now living in the land of Nephi with Nephi and all the other righteous people that followed him and left uh, Laman and Lemuel and their posterity in a different area. But I think it's also important to know who Jacob is not. Because Nephi does consecrate Jacob and Joseph to be teachers, to, you know, religious teachers within their area. But Jacob is not the next political ruler. Nephi was the political ruler. They, they asked Nephi to be their king, basically. We use king from now on, but a uh, prophet leader, right? So Nephi was the prophet, he was in charge of the church, and he was also in charge politically. Jacob, though, not in charge politically. In fact, we don't even know who the next king was, and we don't know anything about the kings for a very long time, many, many generations. So we're not really sure what's happening politically at this point, but we are sure about is these spiritual records, these small plates that Nephi passes on to Jacob, and then Jacob will later pass it on to his son, and we're going to go generation to generation for a while. But they aren't the rulers. Jacob and his son Enos, Jerem, they are not the political rulers. They are just, they have this religious responsibility, father to son, father to son, uh, to keep the spiritual records. So keep that clear. We don't know who the, the kings are. We have no idea. No idea, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, how were the Nephites in general doing at this point? It's kind of an interesting transition because up to this point, Nephi's been telling us like one big detailed story. So we can see like, oh, Laman and Lemuel are choosing wickedness and Nephi's choosing righteousness, right? But from now on, we're going to instead get a lot of commentary about general trends. How are the Nephites doing altogether? Now, does this mean that some people are still righteous and some people are wicked within that community? Absolutely. But we're going to look at general trends. And in fact, Jacob starts to tell us that after Nephi dies, the Nephites start to get wicked. They start to turn to wickedness in general. Nephi dies, it says, 55 years after they first left Jerusalem. Um, and they just start to turn to pride and wickedness. They've been so successful. They've created this great land and been so industrious. And it's the pride that gets them. They start turning away from the Lord. And Jacob's going to definitely address some of that in a speech that he gives. Um, in fact, let's look at how these four chapters are broken up this week. Chapter one is actually just a nice introduction from Jacob. We get to hear kind of his perspective on what's going on. Chapters two and three are a speech that Jacob gives in the temple to his people. A lot of uh, 
condemnation in this speech, a lot of things that the Nephites were not doing well, and Jacob is spiritually calling them out in this one. And then chapter four is not part of this, four, uh, I don't know what number I'm on. Okay, four, uh, Jacob is not telling the speech anymore. Instead, he's just kind of adding his own commentary to what he just taught. Okay. Um, oh, one last thing I wanted to just make sure we're confident on is that we are reading from the small plates right now. Okay. Just, I, I hope you remember that, but keep that in mind because that's about to change very quickly. But we are reading from the small plates. That's what Nephi was asked by the Lord to create to only record things of spiritual importance, things that would point people to Jesus. So first and second Nephi are there. Jacob is going to write on it. And then looking forward, just to give you the real big picture, Enos, Jerem and Omni are also written on the small plates. And then things will change after that point, but <laughs> keep that in mind. This is just being passed from father to son, father to son, a brother here and there. Um, and they're keeping the things of spiritual importance. Okay, let's talk about the chapters. Jacob chapter one, like I said, this is a beautiful introduction that Jacob gives. Um, and he tells us, that Nephi gave him the small plates and told him to only write things of spiritual importance. And Jacob just confirms that he really wants to persuade everyone to come unto Christ who is reading his words. We learn that Nephi anoints a new king. Not sure who it is, but he does it. And then Nephi dies 55 years after leaving Jerusalem. Uh, the Nephites and the Lamanites now are starting to become wicked. Um, and the, the Nephites specifically are becoming more and more wicked. They're turning to their pride. And then Jacob mentions, I think it's kind of interesting, that he received his errand from the Lord in the temple. Very fascinated to see what that, to find out what that could have meant. Um, and then he decides to teach to the people in the temple. So now we've set the scene. This is what we're now going to read in chapters two and three. We're going to read what Jacob preached to his people when he was in the temple. Like I said, not the happiest speech here, but it's what the Nephites needed to hear at that moment. So chapter two, Jacob starts off by saying that he has just been weighed down and grieved with these things that he knows he has to tell his people and he doesn't really want to, but the Lord keeps impressing on him that pattern over and over again in his heart that he's got to say it. He's got to address it. He condemns their wickedness. He condemns their pride. And he encourages everyone to seek the kingdom of God first. Don't seek for the riches of the world first. Seek for the kingdom of God. Everything else will fall into place if you always seek for the kingdom of God first. Um, Jacob then condemns specifically some things that the men are doing. And he shows that the Lord has such compassion on women and children who are being mistreated. And the Nephite men were mistreating their wives and their kids. And the Lord absolutely condemns that and shows his compassion for those who suffer. Um, in chapter three, he continues on with his speech. He does praise the people who are pure in heart. There are some people pure in heart there. Um, and he says that the Nephites are now more wicked than the Lamanites because of how they are treating their wives and their children. It is that serious. They are now more wicked than the Lamanites are. And Jacob warns them against the sin of pride. And he specifically points out and says, you have to stop thinking that you're better than the Lamanites, that you're fine because at least we're better than the Lamanites, because you're actually not. <laughs> you're actually not. And plus, don't believe that even if maybe you were. Stop feeling so prideful towards those other people, right? That separation was causing a lot of pride. Um, and then we, he ends up his speech in chapter four. Um, Jacob is now just kind of writing some additional things to us, basically. He's saying that he wants to record his testimony of Jesus Christ so that he can join his words with the prophets of old and then pass them on to his posterity. What a cool um, tradition that Jacob's able to continue in. Uh, he talks about weakness. He talks about how God has many mysteries. He talks about how we should not counsel the Lord, um, but we should counsel with the Lord. And he uh, reminds us that the Spirit speaks of things as they truly are. And then at the end, he prophesies a little bit that the Jews in Jerusalem will reject Jesus. They will not recognize him as their Messiah, and they will reject Jesus. Okay. 
that's it for this week. Next week we finish up the book of Jacob. There's only two um, sections. There's only seven chapters in all of Jacob. So we're just going to hear a few more chapters from Jacob next week. But that's it. Your turn. Dive into these scriptures. Do what you can to dive into them. Um, my one study tip, if you're feeling like, man, every time I open my scriptures up at night and I just feel like I'm not really getting much out of my scriptures, change up the time that you study. And that seems simplistic, but sometimes we just get it into our brains that like, oh, the only time that works is going to be at night or first thing in the morning, whatever it is. And it changed my life when I realized I could read my scriptures at lunchtime. Or I could read my scriptures just when I thought of it because my kids were all playing happily and I could open my gospel library app and just study right then randomly whatever time it was, right? Um, just I encourage you, if you're having a hard time with the time you've picked right now, try something new. Try something different every day. See what happens. Give yourself the freedom to play around with that and you might find a place that works better or you might be someone who just changes their time every day. I actually do that a lot. I study at different times. And then at the end of the day, if I haven't studied yet, then I study um, in the evening. But I prefer to find an earlier time if I can. So give that a try. Um, and as we're preparing for general conference this week, I think being in the scriptures is a fantastic way to prepare for general conference. I guarantee we're going to hear lots of talks about the Book of Mormon, especially with this being a Book of Mormon Come Follow Me year. So uh, look for lots of references to the Book of Mormon and any other goodness that is given to us by our modern prophets. We're reading ancient prophets and we're going to hear from modern prophets. So much scripture. Um, I think my personal focus question for this week, uh, there's a phrase that Jacob coins that I guarantee you've heard and used in your life. It's in chapter one, verses 18 and 19. He says, magnify his callings. He's talking about how Jacob and his brother Joseph magnified their callings. And Jacob's the one who coins that, which I love because we talk about magnifying our callings all the time. And I just want to think, what does that actually mean? What does it mean to magnify my calling? What does that look like in my life? How could I maybe do a little better or be a little more focused? I think there's a lot of interpretation for magnify that we can look at. Okay, have a great week this week. Make sure you grab your quarter two study guide, enjoy general conference, and happy studying.